This is Olivier Gruner. You are listening to Martial Arts World Radio with Joseph Clark. Welcome to Martial Arts World Radio. I'm your host, Joseph Clark. Over the next hour, we will feature UFC and Bellator veteran Shawnee Carter, action cinema star and martial artist Kerry Hiroyuki Tagawa, and columnist with Martial Arts Illustrated and author, none other than the martial arts woman, Andrea Harkins. This week's inspirational quote is from the movie Kill Bill and goes as follows, Revenge is never a straight line. UFC fighter Chad LaPrise will be conducting a seminar at Phoenix Performance Centre in Mount Forest, Ontario, Canada on February 18th at 1 p.m. You can attend for only $50 and it goes from 1 p.m. to 4 p.m. Check it out at www.phoenixcenter.ca and that's center C-E-N-T-R-E, phoenixcenter.ca for more info. Shawnee Carter, born May 3rd, 1972, is an American mixed martial artist who has competed in the welterweight, middleweight, and light heavyweight divisions. He is a former WEC welterweight champion, a UFC veteran, and a contestant on the Ultimate Fighter 4 reality show. He has also competed in Pancrase, King of the Cage, M1 Global, KSW, and Bellator. Shawnee, in fact, has an incredible fight resume, which also includes international karate competition and titles, state kickboxing titles, grappling, and wrestling competition. He's also been inducted into the USA Martial Arts Hall of Fame, the Action Martial Arts Hall of Fame, and the Masters Hall of Fame. I interviewed Shawnee Carter at the Action Martial Arts Hall of Honors Mega Weekend and Expo in Atlantic City. The following is a remote interview, which I conducted via my microphone, as it took place in an exposition hall. Please excuse the background noise. Ladies and gentlemen, Shawnee Carter. Shawnee Carter, welcome to Martial Arts World Radio. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Uh, truly is our privilege. Now, UFC, Bellator, King of the Cage, all these various fight promotions, all these various fights. Was there, a, was there a particular fight promotion company that was more memorable for you than others? Yes, the, one of the most memorable organizations when I was fighting in Japan. It was so far over the top. The neatness, the punctuality, the organization, the honor, the respect. It was just unprecedented. Pancras, Shuto, Shidokan. Um, anytime I competed in the Orient, it was it was wonderful. Now a lot of fighters that I interview will say that the the uh, Japanese audience has a different kind of appreciation for mixed martial arts than a North American audience. Did you find that? The Japanese have a much higher respect. It's a different energy. They they are quiet. They observe. They learn. They appreciate you. Not just kick him in the balls, kill him. It's it's what the martial arts is supposed to be about, you know. And I just love it. I love them. As a mixed martial artist, is there a particular style to your system that you prefer? Are you more of a striker, or more of a, you know, any style that was uh, more of a favorite style for you? I really have no style. I mean, I've trained in combat do jiu-jitsu, second degree, shidokan, karate, and judo. Thai boxing, boxing, Greco. Okay, if, if you spread a gun in my head, I love Greco-Roman and judo. I love throwing people. It is the most fun, fun, fun thing. Because you can punch somebody, it don't hurt or grace them. You grab them and you throw them and they land on something called Earth. And it hurts because whether you fall from space, you can walk away like the Red Bull guy. You can fall off a ladder and sprain your ankle. When I grab you and throw you, to earth, something to go hurt. <laughs> Shawnee, is there a particular fight that stands out amongst the others or a moment that you would say is a momentous moment in your career? Oh, wow. That is innumerable because I remember so many times getting caught up in that 
moment, the zen, the that that magic moment. I remember fighting Chris Lytle in Japan where I hit him with a knee sweep and I it actually saw it on my face on the video. I went, oh, he landed. Or I remember fighting in the WEC against Jorge Oliveira when he kicked me in the face with a, uh, a Mawashi Getty and he landed solid and I, I flipped him up and said, still here. And I was laughing. I was laughing during the fight. Then there was the epic battles I had with Dave Monet, the first middleweight UFC world champion. The second fight, I beat him the first time, the second fight ended up in a draw. We ended, we both ended up in a hospital laughing about it. So here's to you, Dave Monet, who should be in the UFC Hall of Fame. Shout out to you. Um, so many. But the most momentous thing I've ever had, I remember watching my son being born. I actually watched the water break, his head crowned. I remember t driving slowly to the hospital, stopping at UPS to pick up some UFC gloves. My son's mother hates me for it. Because <laughs> her, 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 her dilations are too far apart. I made her walk up the stairs to the, the maternity ward. Yeah, I did that. That's the type of dad I am. I remember cutting the umbilical cord. I remember catching him as he slid out. I mean, it was just, martial arts is a journey. Fighting, winning a title belt is a destination that I'd never remember. I remember everything I went through to win those belts. I don't remember when they put those belts on my waist. Not one ring girl, not one promoter. I remember smacking a girl in the butt walking by when she started it. <laughs> but it's just, this is a, uh, a never-ending journey to perfection for me that it's so overwhelming that, wow, I'm here. Shawnee, did you have martial artists or fighters that you admired as you were coming up through the ranks? I actually admired Muhammad Ali, Bruce Lee, Chuck Norris. I saw a little bit of Cynthia Rothrock. But what really, really wanted me to get, get me in was the five deadly venoms. I don't know if y'all, most people that are old school martial arts fight movie fans, it was the five deadly venoms. That was it for me. Um, End of the Dragon with Bruce Lee. It's too many to name from Chuck Norris. Too many. You know, uh, Scott Atkins, Michael Jai White, I, uh, Jet Li, Jackie Chan. I love them. All of it now for me is just amazing. And I look around, this, I'm sitting in this room going, wow. I mean, okay, yeah, I got belts. But those are the pioneers. I go, Yoda, there's female Yoda. There's another female Yoda. And looking at she and Cynthia Rothrock and they, across the hallway from Don the Dragon Wilson. I'm like, seeing Chuck Zito. Sifu Allen Goldberg, you know, Fred the Hammer Williamson. I knew Sammy Davis Jr. did martial arts. You know, it was just, it was crazy. Was oh my God, that, that was hilarious. I didn't, I never looked at his hands until one day I saw a demo. And there were some questions I want to ask this, this epic generation of martial artists because there are questions that I can't get with the new guys. And some stuff you can't Google like I heard a story about a guy named Victor Moore, Vic Moore, and I'm like, hey, what's the story? I, I wasn't there, I need to know. Well, I bring up some old, Sheon Lewis, you know, I, I just like, I want to know, I want to know. If I, if I ruffle some feathers, everybody, please excuse me. Dan the Beast Severn, he's been around forever. I did a fight with, not, not fought him, but fight card together with him. And it's just so many names to name that Chow Yun Fat. <laughs> you know, it's just so many. I'm just like, wow. And everybody wonders, when, when I'm, the guy said, when are you going to stop fighting? Sean I said, y'all need to put me in movies because I'll protect the goods. Other than that, I'm going to keep competing. So, Shawnee, I have to ask, all these years, all these fights, all these belts sitting on this table here, how is it you have a face of a Hollywood movie star with no scars, no bruises? Okay, I exfoliate. 
I keep my hands up. I move a lot. I do cardio more than I do the punching and kicking. I will do, if I'm training for a fight, my, my training camp is fundamentally based on movement, hands up, a lot of ab, like core work. I'm a personal training director for LA Fitness. And I tell people the basic fundamentals that I, a lot of ab work, hands up, I move away from the power side, and I use a good old cocoa butter. And the art. I don't know. A, a lot of people, a lot of martial artists have asked me, how? I said, 247 fight, 248. Some of those a bunch of fights. Not to mention the wrestling and boxing and kickboxing. But, yeah, I exfoliate. <laughs> I wonder how many professional boxers and UFC fighters exfoliate besides yourself. I, well, I would think, you know, maybe Conor McGregor, uh, I, well, he got enough damn money to do it. <laughs> um, I don't know if John Jones does. He wears a beard. Yeah, there's some ugly dudes out there, man, in MMA. I'm Shawnee, a moment ago you alluded to the birth of your child, obviously a momentous occasion. Now, taking a look at some kind of life challenge, an unfortunate life event, some kind of human event that you had to persevere through, was there a particular moment in your life where your martial arts training and your character and your discipline helped you get through a personal problem? Most definitely. I don't mind sharing it. I've had a couple. In lieu of everything that I've done and been through and, go and achieved, losing a house to foreclosure, losing a car to repossession, trying to make the Olympics in wrestling. Losing my grandfather, losing my, well, my grandparents, first of all. Going through the things of understanding that my dad has cancer, my mom has diabetes. Well, my dad is easily recovered. Now, I ain't gonna lie, I do teasing. He's the fattest cancer patient in the world, and it's my fault. I told him about acai berry, dark chocolate, and marijuana. It kills cancer cells. I should have never told a 60-some year old man that. Wow, my dad living large, six four, about 280. In lieu of going through the struggles, literally, with his me damn near facing jail time or, or losing a home, I'm still standing. I'm here. And I tell people, fake it till you make it. Never, and if you have to, break it. Just do what you need to do. Execute accordingly to, you know, to actuate efficiently, to achieve that goal. Make a plan. And that's all I do is I plan on getting better. And no matter what stands before me, the good Lord will get, show me a way. And I'm going to execute according to what he wants me to do. Shawnee, great wisdom and advice. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. It was my pleasure. My shout outs to everybody because my three kids, all the World Martial Arts Association, Action Martial Arts, Sifu Goldberg, all of you guys. I love you. I mean it. Thank you. And thank you. This has been an interview with UFC veteran and Hall of Fame fighter, Shawnee Carter. Hi, this is Keith Vitale, and you're listening to Martial Arts World Radio with Joseph Clark. For those of you listening to Martial Arts World Radio while well, on your phones, tablets, or laptops, be sure to check out www.bobwallworldblackbelt.com, the world's foremost martial arts online community. Kerry Hiroyuki Tagawa is a martial artist, stuntman, and actor who made his Hollywood debut in the film The Last Emperor and went on to do a massive list of film and television roles over a 30-year career, which include the films Mortal Kombat, Showdown in Little Tokyo with Dolph Lundgren and Brandon Lee, The Perfect Weapon, The Last Warrior, Rising Sun with Sean Connery and Wesley Snipes, The Art of War, 47 Ronin. The list of his body of work is one of the most impressive that I've ever encountered from a cinema star guest. Equally impressive was his philosophical insights and personal views. Kiri Hiro, Yuki Tagawa, welcome to Martial Arts World Radio. Thank you so much. Thank you. Kerry, if you could take a look back in your youth, earlier in life, what was your first exposure to martial arts and what kind of an impression did that make on you? 
mine is is I mean I have an actual beginning but energetically and I'm all about the energy of things um, my awareness of an energy of who I am began when I was six when we went from Tokyo to Fort Bragg North Carolina <laughs> and and that began an awareness of what I believe martial arts is about. It's the recognition, the acknowledgement of your own energy and other people's energy and how to move within that. And so I would say six. My formal study didn't start till 11 when I started in Kendo. So unusual, I think, for the majority of martial artists um, that start immediately into into karate or taekwondo or kung fu. I started in kendo, and and I liken kendo to immediately going into battle. <laughs> you know, in in going into a, a martial arts class these days, you can study form, you can understand, you know, do um, a lot of things that kendo drives you right to the core. <laughs> You're going to get hit. And that's why you wear the protection. So it puts you into that animal kind of mode of fight or flight. And uh, that was quite a valuable experience. I didn't start uh, karate until I was 21. And then around 24 or 5, decided to explore other styles and then knew that I was done with the fighting part of the martial arts. And uh, I left um, and really explored the healing martial arts. I had that sense that fighting wasn't for me, trophies weren't for me, schools weren't for me. It was about how can I develop something that very much personalizes my life, my uh, goals, um, have a, a something running throughout my family genes that that always thinks about the world of people. I think that's the most important aspect of looking back on my life uh, is how much I've had a heart, a big heart, for other people. And in my native culture, we think of the other person first. We, we think about the effect on another person, how my energy will affect another person, um, and how is it that can I help them have a better experience. Uh, so it's a noble goal, but it, it's something so basically genetic I didn't even question it at all uh, until I came to America, where immediately it was clear. <laughs> We weren't all Japanese. <laughs> Quite amazingly not Japanese. Uh, for a Japanese family, half the family is from the U.S. Army, and the other half is from the Imperial Japanese Navy. And to be raised in the U.S. military, uh, my dad was a lifer uh, from Hawaii. And, uh, and then on the other side, being raised with imperial Japanese sort of values. It's been an interesting journey. But I'm, I'm ready now to really present my own system, which is a healing art, healing martial arts. Very simple, very powerful. Now, going back to Kendo, I mean, Kendo is a very disciplined and structured martial art. I imagine there's no fast track to it. So that would be a healthy introduction for a, a young martial artist, I would suspect. Yes, and, and in that there is no fast track, then you relax about getting belts or moving up. Um, you just know you're in it. And, and these are all thoughts, after thoughts, long after the thought. Um, because when you're in it, you're just immersed. And I think it's a, a good first art 
you get the taste right away. You get a sense of the energetics of it right away. Um, and you find out if you're willing to make a commitment <laughs> to getting hit. And, and that wasn't an easy thing to do. Um, because I, I was hit as a child, and it wasn't like I was left black and blue and my dad was hitting me with his fist, but he would definitely, yeah, <laughs> spank us or enough physical contact where he definitely had a healthy uh, respect for him and knew how to have a fear of him, <laughs> which uh, has good, bad, and ugly ramifications, but uh, it ultimately benefited me. And Carrie, when you were discussing, or you just described a moment ago, uh, considering the other person first, would you describe that as altruism? Um, altruistic to humanity. Um, altruistic to the best of who we are. The idea of sharing. The idea of helping each other. It happens with farmers. Their barn burns down. Everybody jumps in and rebuilds that barn because it's that critical to the livelihood of a family and to families around them that, that they sell their things to, you know, but um, I think we've lost so much of that. It, it's such a trip when you think about as we grew up, how much we rebelled against as a teenager just for the sake of rebellion, which is never changed, was still ongoing, but for people of my generation, we still knew people, grandmothers and, and relatives, and uh, had examples of people who really knew the value of work. Working on a farm is just like, whoa. Every kid <laughs> to graduate needs to go do some farm work. They need to be getting up in the morning when it's dark, getting out and getting their hands dirty and feeling a sense of satisfaction from just the fact of being alive. I think mean, we're missing so much of that, experiencing life. We're experiencing Hollywood. We're experiencing reality shows, selfies, all that kind of stuff, which is way understandable considering the pattern of Hollywood. Um, I'm lucky that I was a little older when I got into Hollywood. I had a little bit more sensibility. Did go through all that kind of hyped up modality. Um, but I kept my head in, in the healing. So I luckily escaped. <laughs> but still still in it. I'm certainly still working and, and happy to be working. But I understand my, my, and this is what I vowed when I went into Hollywood that should I reach any notoriety that I would be bringing it back to my art. So it's, it's that moment. That's where this interview began. <laughs> was that altruistic? Uh, it obviously comes very naturally to you. Was that something that was ingrained in you from your own family? Was it something that you just feel that you might have spiritually inherited? Or was this something that over time you became conscious about as you became a celebrity? It's absolutely genetic. It's DNA. It's ancestry. It's legacy um, that it began at. And I think had I not been raised in the United States, I might not have gained as much consciousness about it. And so I, I certainly honor this country and, and thank thank this country and people of this country uh, for that opportunity. It sounds like such an immigrant song, but I'm an immigrant. I'm F-O-B. I came on a boat. I went from a boat from Tokyo to Honolulu to San Francisco. So I'm an immigrant and I'm proud of it. Proud to be Japanese. There's plenty of things not to be proud of, but there's plenty of things that any racial group doesn't have any reason to be proud, you would think. But but we can always find the good, bad, and ugly. And, um, yeah, it's uh, a continuing thing, this consciousness, building, growing, awareness. My next step definitely is to take the healing to the world. Um, just on the verge, there are 
some great indications from the universe. This is what I'm supposed to be doing, so happy to be here. Carrie, what systems have you incorporated or did you include in your martial arts journey that now would be part of your repertoire? Well, besides the actual fighting of kendo and actual fighting of karate, um, uh, when I left the fighting aspect, there was really no guidebook. <laughs> there was no guidelines. Um, mentors that I could seek that could fulfill a massive hunger and a thirst for for knowledge. Um, at that time Tai Chi and yoga were kind of just building in the US. Uh, never even got close to thinking about Qigong. I went into reading a lot of philosophy, a lot of Asian philosophy, a lot of Buddhism. Um, I read some Marxism, uh, Sufism, uh, through different stages, went through the Quran, went through the Krishna movement. Um, just nothing but a constant search. And I tried most anything <laughs> that I came across. But in the end, the thing that really kept expanding and what I collected from these different experiences um, was an understanding there's not a whole lot we can do by ourselves. It really comes from an inherent divine, heavenly, uh, whatever our concepts are about that, but an energetic that definitely is constantly there and available to tap into to to ask and also to serve very much uh, a whole key part to my my genetic makeup is service and uh, the only thing that didn't work so well was sort of self-serving kind of um, attitude that, that I grew up in America surrounded by, certainly. It was, it was an interesting time to be raised after the Second World War, because it, it definitely shook the whole box, and people were still scrambling, and America was looking for an identity, and, and the world was trying to get back on its feet. So I was not born in this moment <laughs> of, well, it's kind of come full circle in that way, and, and I really do identify with millennials. It's not an easy thing to find your way in this, this scenario, in this puzzle. And I identify with them the questions they're asking, the kind of uh, dilemmas they're going through, and, and I would like to, to help ease that, maybe make it a little clearer, clearer perception about life in general. It's not always just the environments um, that we're given to deal with that are, have anything to do with reality <laughs> of who we are as human beings. But um, I have great faith in this generation. It's all we got. And not because that's all we got, but we as adults have to share that with them and speak their language. I, I understand their language. <laughs> so I'm, I'm really looking forward to this next step. Yeah. Carrie, you and I have taken similar spiritual paths. Obviously, I, I'm probably a little earlier in life on mine, than, uh, and, and you've got more time in country in that regard. But I can tell you that hosting a radio show, being involved in sales and marketing, and then going back to my prayer, my meditation, my reflection, and the, the two can almost conflict at times. Almost, I would say it's, it's difficult for someone to be a Zen monk by day or by night and then be a stockbroker by day. The two, so in that vein, is it challenging for you to separate the spiritual path from being a Hollywood actor and celebrityism? No. <laughs> There's no question in my mind. And 
for me in a, in a very martial arts Aikido fashion is how to use one to <clears throat> enhance the other. So when, when I came to Hollywood, I was very clear. I was already working in, in developing of, of this system like about seven years and I made a vow that in coming into Hollywood should I gain any notoriety that I would use that attention for for the art so it's it's been attention from the beginning just thankful to be at this point now <laughs> of um, being able to really do my life's work Hollywood's a hobby <laughs> it's my day job it's something that I enjoy massively enjoy acting but I don't know that because I'm an actor that the world will be a better place but I know that by my life's work this healing aspect is is going to affect a lot of lives in a very positive way yeah. how does one individual help to heal the entire world by healing themselves first um, I think we're all cells of one body. We have a responsibility to that body. And in that, if you as a cell are not functioning at its greatest or in its greatest capacity, then you're blocking energy. Energy has to go around you. So certainly the more that we clear ourselves, get clear perception of what the whole experiment's about, then the energy can flow through us. And as it flows through, that, through us, we're able to share that more, um, more clearly. So you must be in a state of healing yourself, and in that way that will help the whole planet. If you can do something more than that, that's all extra. And it's good. It's good to have that but it starts with self. In terms of your film career, at what age did Hollywood discover you, and would you be able to tell us a bit of a concise story about how you got introduced to film? It starts at eight years old, <laughs> with uh, my mother having been an actress in Japan, would take me to movies and give me critiques. I mean, they, how much can a child understand at eight? But but oddly enough, I I was able to get bits and pieces of what acting was about, and when I when I understood it, um, in what they were intending to do, and then watched great performances, I thought that's kind of a cool job <laughs> to share with people. So that's when it happened, and I I'm so patient. I'm probably one of the most patient people I know, but. Um, when I was in high school and being the only Japanese a or Asian in the whole school played King Arthur in Camelot played Plato in Rebel Without a Cause I mean I had a lot of guts if <laughs> anything in my life it's all about being being fearless and uh, yeah and then waiting from the time I was 17 being told you know don't rush just take your time and didn't tell me it would take 19 years but at 36 I, I got into Hollywood as an extra I did this is just historical it sounds like too weird to be true but it happened I had one extra job and then I got my screen actors guild union card and then I was off to China to be in the last emperor so it happened so quickly I think <laughs> that's a the, the gift of having been so patient that it moved quickly when it started um, and it hasn't stopped since so I'm ready to slow down for my for my true life work and uh, I don't know through all the good bad and the ugly the bouncing and being thrown up against the wall <laughs> you know just so much abuse that I put myself through I don't really blame anybody or have any anger left over about it. It's now turned to what's necessary for the next step. And it's, it's uh, for lack of a better word, a little bit of wisdom on how it blended all together in martial arts definitely was a, a beginning for all that understanding. Carrie, do you have a preference in film characters between playing the good guys, the bad guys, neutral characters? Well, 
I really enjoyed my career as a bad guy. It helped me deal with my anger. I got paid to get my anger out on the screen. <laughs> and and uh, I enjoyed that period. Um, although I have to say, I massively enjoy playing good guys now. And I knew the time would come. That's why I was patient. Um, I knew if I would just stick to the quality of my work, that that would carry me through. And the greatest thing for an actor is longevity. And that takes perseverance without abusing yourself and getting lost in, in the hype of all the publicity and all of that. I had went through different stages of, of dealing with it, but, but knowing that there was an ultimate purpose for patience. So now, as a trade minister and man in the high castle for Amazon, it's probably been the the peak point of my good guys, I'm, although I know it's just beginning. I'm, I'm entering the second half. I'm going to enjoy playing good guys as well as I did playing bad guys in the first half. And looking back on your body of work, is there a particular film or character to date that you would count amongst your favorite? I would give you three. <laughs> and, and certainly The Last Emperor, to play a chief eunuch, you're not going to get stereotyped as a eunuch, but that was such a, an incredible artistic way to begin a film career, career with Bernardo Bertolucci and China. It's, it's, I almost blurted out, how much do I have to pay? You know, like, that was an amazing beginning. Um, and then I would say my, among my first roles, most impacting emotionally was a movie called American Me, based on a true story of the only Japanese in the Mexican Mafia, it, in the very beginnings of the Mexican Mafia, it was a highly emotional situation. It was the week that we started that movie, and just getting my mind frame into being a prisoner, incarcerated, my mother passed away. And so it, it, it really took that whole experience to another level, uh, to do a movie during that time. Another one would be Johnny Tsunami, where I played a surfing grandfather for Disney, you know, and after playing all those bad guys, the guy, are you kidding me? They're calling me to read for this thing. <laughs> and um, I knew that it, it was time. I'm one of those people that is very instinctive and very intuitive. Uh, didn't quite see that one coming when it did, but... Uh, yeah, that was like my number one, one of three of number ones. <laughs> yeah, and certainly this this role as a trade minister and man in the high castle, another landmark. So can't complain. <laughs> beautiful, been a beautiful life. Now as I get older, just see it more and more so that way as a a legacy of beauty and really consider myself an artist and looking forward to a lot of, a lot more years of creativity. Yeah. And Carrie, our wrap-up question, is there anything that I have not asked that you think is relevant or pertinent that you would like to impart with us as a uh, sign-off for our listeners? Everybody look into Canada real quick. <laughs> now. <laughs> It, Canada is one of the best kept secrets in the world. It truly exemplifies what America could be. As much as there's negativity in the U.S., if you really understand Canada, it's been an experiment that's give, been given an incredible environment to to grow within. And it's a perfect example, especially for Western societies, of a culture that lives by nature. The, the national character of Canadians has so much to do with a true essential DNA connection with nature that they probably don't even think about a whole lot. That's how natural it is. It's so uh, loving 
it's so respectful. I mean, we got human problems, you know, as any country would, between people. But, but genetically, DNA to the bone, a culture raised in nature is going to have a whole different makeup than country built in cities and conflict. So hats off to Canada and really the rest of the planet, guys understand there's potential for who we are. Well, as a Canadian, I thank you. And Carrie, thank you for your time today. And we wish you all the best on your ongoing endeavors and travels. Thank you very much. You too. This has been an interview with martial artist and actor Carrie Hiroyuki Tagawa. Hi, I'm Don the Dragon Wilson, and you're listening to Joseph Clark at Martial Arts World Radio. Andrea Harkins, also known as the Martial Arts Woman, is an internationally recognized writer, motivator, and martial artist. She writes for Martial Arts Illustrated UK, the Martial Arts Guardian UK, MA Success, Martial Arts Business Australia, the World Martial Arts Magazine, the Parish Village News, and her blog, The Martial Arts Woman. She has been featured as a rising star in the World Martial Arts Magazine in 2015, and in 2016 she was featured in Martial Arts Illustrated UK, for her application of positivity to life and martial arts. Andrea has been interviewed on numerous martial art and positivity podcast shows, including Martial Thoughts, Martial Art Nation, Warrior Cast, Dynamic Dojo Radio Show, and more, where she has shared her insightful messages of positivity, hope, and inspiration. Her mission is to help others live more positive, happy, and rewarding lives. She is an accomplished martial artist and the author of the book, The Martial Arts Woman. Andrea Harkins, author of The Martial Arts Woman, thank you for joining us. Welcome to Martial Arts World Radio. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure to be here. It really is. I thank you for having me, and I'm just very excited. Andrea, you have been featured as a columnist in several martial art magazines. However, you've also been featured for your philosophies and your life coaching and motivational skills. Would you please tell us, what is your calling? Yes, you know, a few years ago, I decided to start writing a blog. A friend of mine said, hey, you know what, you're a good writer, and as a martial artist, you could probably put this together and create a blog. And I'm not a very technical person, so uh, it took me a while to figure out how to even create a website and do all that kind of thing. But I, I was very excited about writing about martial art experiences as they touched my life. I thought, you know, you don't really see a lot of people writing about this. You don't hear about it a lot. But martial arts really touches your life in a very positive way. And if you could take some of those concepts and apply them to life, um, apply them to your daily living or to your obstacles, then that is a really valuable tool that a lot of us overlook. So I, I took that positivity through martial arts outlook and used it in my writing. And it was just going to be a blog. I really didn't expect much more to happen from that. But I had written a couple of articles for a, an industry magazine called MA Success prior to the blog. And as I started writing, though, you know, more and more magazines would contact me and say, hey, you know, we'd like you to write something for us. We like that woman perspective. We don't have, there's not a lot of women writing out there about martial arts. We like that perspective. We like the positivity, the inspiration. And so it just sort of flowed into different magazines. And I write for a couple of UK magazines. Um, there's an Australian business magazine that I'll be writing for. Uh, it's just been really fantastic in the way it's been received by readers and other people who, you know, have been looking for something like this maybe in their own life. So it all started from that blog that I still write. It's very, it's an active blog and very popular because it's about life. And although it has the martial art twist, a lot of the readers are not martial artists. They just enjoy how the stories flow and, and the meaning that comes from it. So that's how it all began. For our listeners today who are on their devices, what web URL would you like to direct them to? 
I have my blog website, which really has uh, all the information they would need. They can contact me through there. They can read the blog. Uh, there's a link to my e-commerce store where I sell a couple of martial art-inspired things in my book. And that would be www.themartialartwoman.com. Andrea, you no doubt help a lot of people. What is your ultimate goal in doing this? You know, I have a big goal. I have a huge goal, and that is to make our world a better place through positivity. I think that there's a lot of negativity in our world. We all know that. And change really has to start with the individual. We each need to do our part to change the world to be a better place. So part of that is changing our mindset from negativity or from feeling like victims or, you know, just not being the positive side of things. And we need to turn that around. And part of what I try to do is is remind people to turn that around, to remind them of their their worth and their value because sometimes we forget how unique we are and we're special and we all have gifts and talents. Uh, So part of it is to remind people about that. Part of them is to allow them to see parts of my life where I've struggled and worked through things to show them that you can push through and you can get to the other side. And when we all start believing in ourselves and in each other and we start helping each other and encouraging each other, this is what changes our world, changes our neighborhood or community and and even even bigger so my goal is really to do my part to help change our world for the better uh, through positivity and uh, what i call a martial art mindset and it's something that everyone can do and everyone can participate in and everyone can feel better about who they are and about their lives so it's really my overall goal Andrea, what is the basis of your expertise and qualifications in coaching people and writing? The life coaching is really an evolution of what I've done through the blog, through my writing, through my 28 years as a martial artist. Um, The life coaching is something I've done all my life. I have a natural ability and gift to talk to people and make them feel comfortable and They have always come to me, people, strangers, friends, have always come to me just to chat or sometimes to ask advice or whatever it may be. And so when I started writing and I started being seen as an expert in the industry as far as um, positivity and, and helping people overcome obstacles or having the kind of mindset that they need to overcome obstacles, Then I started applying that to life coaching. And because so many people started asking me if I would do life coaching sessions with them, this is what rolled me into um, that aspect of um, my professional life. And the life coaching has been really a gift to both me and to the people uh, who talk to me and want to learn how to set the goals. You know, I just, I again, I use martial arts. Martial arts is my credential for this. Um, martial arts in teaching me how to overcome, how to set goals. Um, life coaching is a lot like going from white to black belt. You start off with a struggle. You start off not knowing. Uh, you start off wondering what to do. And then you keep taking a step forward and another step forward. One day you receive your black belt because you've been able to push through and move forward each obstacle, and that's exactly what I use in my life coaching, step-by-step approach um, to help you move past the obstacles, to set the goals, to achieve the goals. Um, And so this is what I work with people all the time on setting their goals and helping them to achieve and applying, you know, the martial art philosophy. People love martial arts, whether or not they're martial artists. They see a magic in it. They know there's something special about it. And when you can take that and apply it to a person's life and they can look at their life uh, through the eyes of a martial artist or a martial art mindset, then they start to see themselves in a whole different way, just like a beginning martial artist 
starts to learn confidence and feel confidence uh, or they start to um, have new views on life or perspectives on their own abilities and they start raising um, their perception of who they are. Um, All of this is what I use in the life coaching concept. Have you yourself experienced some unfortunate human events or challenges that you had to persevere through where you applied the fundamentals of your philosophy and martial arts in order to persevere through it? Yes, absolutely. And and those experiences are what have formed um, the person I am known as the martial arts woman. Um, in my book, and I'll talk about that later if you'd like, but there are a couple of my personal stories in there. Um, a pregnancy that was very difficult where I was told my child was um, destined to die before before giving birth. Um, and the interesting thing was that I started to believe what the doctors were telling me because, you know, that's what you do when somebody tells you a medical situation, but Sometimes you forget, forget that you have the power in your own mind and you have the power to push through. Now, you can't change what's going to happen, but you can push through, and sometimes that makes the difference. And so in the midst of that um, very difficult time, I decided that I was going to not be, um, you know, a mother who's going to lose her child, but I'm going to be a martial artist. And I started practicing katas in my mind because I was on bed rest and I started envisioning myself as you know sparring a a big opponent someone bigger than me and realizing that you know I had the ability to do that and and as my my physical martial arts self that I knew how to spar other people and I knew how to break through barriers and I learned how to break boards and if I could do those things, then I could push myself um, to believe in myself and when I really needed to and when this pregnancy was destined to die, I really decided that it was up to me to get through it. Now, I couldn't, of course, change destiny, what was meant to happen, but what I could do was change how I felt about it and how I thought about and how I reacted to it and that's what I did. I changed feeling like a victim and I changed all the worry and stress and decided that I would simply do exactly what I needed to do to push through it just like I would for any martial art technique, board break, sparring match and you know in the end I was victorious. It worked out for me Um, and I truly believe it was because I turned into a martial artist instead of, um, you know, a mother who was going to lose her child. And that's what pushed me through. And that's one of my stories. I have several, but that's that's one that touches a lot of people because many people are parents or mothers and can understand the the feeling of dread that they would feel being, you know, hearing that kind of news. So that's one of the situations personally that I've been through. Well, I wish to recognize and salute you for your courage, and I'm sorry that you had to go through that experience. However, there is no school, there's no university or certification program that can train you and prepare you for life like those experiences. Those in itself are qualifications. Yeah. Uh, yeah. As far as that pregnancy, by, by the way, it was a viable pregnancy, and I did carry him to term, um, and that He's one of four children that I have, and he's 15 years old now. Andrea, as a wrap-up question and some closing remarks, would you impart us some wisdom for any of our listeners who are experiencing some unfortunate life events of their own, which they are persevering through now, your martial art mindset fundamentals? Yes, I would say that uh, the martial art mindset really encompasses a lot of different things. It's perseverance. It's belief in yourself. It's humility. What you need to know is that there is a way to break through or go around every obstacle and barrier. There is, believe it or not, something positive in every negative. And I believe that from what I've been through and from what I've seen in other people's lives because we all have struggles. But when you believe 
and positivity, which simply means that you're going to do everything you can uh, with an open mind to push through and get to the other side of where you are when it's a difficulty, um, then you are going to find that you will look back on it and you will you will have you will be a different person because of it. You'll be the person that you're meant to be because of it. So um, there is a reason for every struggle, and I know that's sort of trite, but when you persevere, knowing that you're doing your part, you're using your strength, your empowerment, then it, it just changes it so it's not so difficult, and it gives you better insight when you're on the other side of it. Andrea, thanks very much for joining us today and for sharing, and we wish you all the very best on your future endeavors. Thank you. I can't thank you enough for the opportunity to be here, and I wish you the very best as well. You have been listening to an interview with the martial arts woman, Andrea Harkins. Be sure to check us out at www.mawradio.com and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube by following Martial Arts World Radio. I'm Joseph Clark wishing you safe travels. 